Hey there everybody, Joe here. Thanks for tuning in again. I read some of the comments that were talking about suggesting different positions and I started to examine it myself thinking, yeah, I don't think this is optimized. So after thinking about what would just make the perspective more extreme so that it looks like you're right there and that head is close and that body's really far. Just more contrast between the front and the background. I just decided to redo it because that first one was all right, just all right. I wasn't happy, but my point in saying this is that I really wish that I could just package it up in a can and just give it out the freedom that I've found in being able to just redo things because over the years in my practice, painting and my research, I've prioritized learning how the techniques, how the strategy works rather than striving for the finished piece. I actually don't have very many nice finished pieces because my goal was not nearly as much to have the nice finished pieces as it was to learn how to make the pieces. I always found myself studying, well, what is it that makes a thing look like it's going this way than this way or closer here, further here? What is it that makes a thing look like it's a three-dimensional object with just color? And it was always my goal to figure those things out so that I would have control. Control is such a valuable thing to have. And so that is my goal with posting these videos is to, to share those discoveries with you so that you can hopefully just add what I found to your work. Maybe you can be the one that has the nice pieces that are selling in galleries. I added to the perspective on this one. You can see I made the head bigger. I made the background smaller. So that's obvious. Just like I described in the last video two weeks ago, that extreme difference between the foreground and the background suggests that you're closer to the object because the percentage of the total distance changes. You know, the, the size differences aren't based on any particular distance. It is based on the change of distance. So if this goes from 50 feet to 200 feet, then obviously that's gonna be a, a much more extreme size change than 50 feet to only 100 feet. And so if I want this to look like a really large object that I'm standing close to, I need to make an extreme difference in size. Sometimes it's easy to forget that. It seems obvious when I say that, you know, further distance means smaller size. It's, but it's easy to forget when, especially when you don't have real models to look at. If you've only looked at small things, you know, and I, and I take this brush and I hold it up, there's just not a lot of difference in size from the close end to the far end of this brush. You're at uh, six feet from this brush right now, so eight inches of distance is a very small percentage, but if I put it way up here, all of a sudden there's that big size difference in the front of the brush compared to the back of the brush. So in painting, it's good to just always be conscious of that. Well, so then there's another element that comes into play as I'm adding color, and, and that is that just as a general rule, as a surface tilts away from your eye, and by away from your eye, I mean that toward your eye is looking at a flat wall, and then uh, away from your eye is looking along that flat surface. On this, you can see that on, on the head, all of my color are on the surfaces facing toward me, and I teach this all the time in painting water. It's the same concept. I want him to look like he's coming out of the water, he's wet, so I want it to, in the end, uh, look reflected. So I'm starting out with those kinds of colors, but even with something that's not covered with water, the same rule still applies. If you make the colors more gray, that are bending along the side, they're always more reflective than if than they would be if they were facing like this. You know, looking flat at a wall, if that wall turns, regardless of how shiny it is, it'll be m most colorful when I'm looking directly at it. Anytime you combine different colors of light, the result is grayer than either of the two colors. The result of like a blue sky reflection on a brown object, it's always going to be more gray, whether it's a yellow light on a red object, green light on a blue object. Every, anytime you combine those, those colors, color plus another color with light, it gets closer to white light because white is the combination of all of them. So, general rule, just make the colors more gray if you want them to look like an edge that's turning away from the viewer's eye. So you can see here on the front of the cheekbone, I put more color. I made it darker because I want it to look like there's light behind from the sky, so something facing toward me is in more of a shadow. But I add the color 
so that I can double up on that effect. Not only is it dark, but it's also colorful, saying that it's not turned this way and reflecting. The nose, you can see it's darker and more brown. And the front of the eyes, darker and more brown. The front of this ridge, darker and more brown. Same thing, you know, everywhere I have an edge that's turning away. Same with this. Now, the muscles on the neck, you know, like, like the uh, verses say, strength resides in his neck, so I wanted a big muscly neck. So, I put this grayer color right in the middle of that darker color. The darker is the shadow of the muscle turning down. The lighter color says that that angle is not facing straight toward me, but it's maybe picking up light that's reflecting off of the ground, maybe off the side. Notice there's less gray as I move this way. That causes this part of the neck to look like it's coming more toward the viewer. This part of the neck, all of that brown in there, not so much gray, says it's moving a little more to the right. So this neck has a nice curve that's going to the right and then toward the viewer. At the same time, and see the color sends the message that it's going this way, then this way, yet the shape says it's going up and then down. So then I have this more complex curve to the neck. I have this diagonal swoop to it that makes the picture feel more alive, like there's movement in there uh, to me. Same with this, same things. So wherever I have an edge, just like when I paint water and waves, wherever I have the back side facing toward the background, I have that reflection color. And, and all I did for now was just make it gray because I know that anything that's grayer than the colors I'm using on all of the faces is going to make it look like it's bending away. That in combination with the perspective of the shapes really enhances the three-dimensional quality of a picture. Now another thing with the person. You can see I did the same thing, grayer colors uh, using more of a violet because I want, I want them to look like they have a reddish brown skin tone. I want dark skinned people in this picture. That combined with blue light that I'll eventually put in the sky, brown plus blue and, and light makes a gray violet. So I used more of a violet color. I moved this person up. The reason I did that is because it places the viewer in the same height perspective as the person. So it feels like you're in that picture. If this eye height is close to the horizon. You see my horizon is probably below this wave. So maybe this person is even a little bit above the horizon. So it puts you down as the viewer at the perspective of these people so that I can really communicate the feel of this the scary size of this creature where if I had it like I initially did then the viewer is bigger it, it makes you bigger it makes you taller than the horizon and this doesn't feel quite as big if all the people are down here even though I have all this extreme perspective it still helps even more to put the comparison I'm gonna do the same thing probably with these guys make them bigger and up higher, chain, make the perspective, the ground more level. And, and th this person, I brought the feet all the way down, so really all together is just bigger. So it helps make it more extreme at the same time. One of these days I got to do a series on how to paint uh, human anatomy, but you know, I've learned so much only recently. That's why I've, I've delayed doing that, because it's been a fun learning experience for me studying this because uh, I did so many landscapes early on. Uh, it's been a newer thing for me to really get into human anatomy. But you can't see my how to draw a person video where I map out where all of these muscles of the front side is just the front side of a man and a woman on my how to draw a person video. But I find it helpful. Just the more you can remember, the better. The more you can do by memory, the more you can paint from your imagination because you know the parts that need to be included and you, you don't have to ever look at something to see what parts are there. You know what parts are there. You just look at just the attributes of those already known things. So you move a lot faster and more confidently when you have parts of things memorized. So over the years I've done a lot of studying just out of love for shapes, the beauty of anatomy and shapes. I've accumulated a lot of memorized knowledge that helps me a lot with trying to produce what's in my imagination. Let's look at comments from last week's post. So I'm painting Harry Potter flying after a snitch for my son Joseph and I had a lot more trouble with it than I anticipated when I started. And so it's been uh, an adventure trying to figure things out. Thank you, Miss Lovely Shot, for the nice compliment. I really appreciate that. It's always nice to hear. Alicia says, great work, Mirror Joe, but where's his scar? Oh man, I did forget that. I forgot it, but I wouldn't have finished the painting and not put the scar in. Actually, I probably would have. 
Have you ever painted a sign and realized after you got far along on the lettering that you left out a letter? So I've done that. Man, is that a bummer. Michael Montgomery, thank you for the encouragement once again and uh, the, the uh, success report. He says, stumbled upon your channel and I'm so glad I did. I really appreciate your down to earth. Can do, so can you approach. It's really encouraging me to have a go. And I love to hear that. That was my experience was getting past that point of having the freedom and confidence to just go for it. And I love to hear uh, other people experiencing that. It's a very freeing feeling to just dive in, paint, and we'll just figure it out as we go. It's, it's a, a fun thing for me. I think it's always easier to steer a moving vehicle. You know, I think, I think you've probably heard an analogy like that. A small rudder can steer a, a giant ship, you know, but things need to be in motion before you're able to identify how, how to adjust. And that's how I feel about painting, just throwing paint on the canvas and moving, and then uh, don't be obsessed with results. You know, you just target one task at a time and just study it as you're moving. That's my approach. You know, I'm, I'm, that's like some of the most vague instructions I've probably ever given. <laughs> Ken Wells says, if you paint flexible objects, then you can add rubber latex to your acrylic paint to maintain a flexible coating. So does that mean there is latex that you can add to the paint? I honestly don't know. Now I'm curious. Michael Rogers, thank you for the nice compliment. It says, it looks very professional finish now. Fair play for sticking with it. Murphy's Crazy Cat, thanks for sticking up for me. Death Ranger, a very nice compliment. First of all, thank you so much. I did post that one painting on eBay and <laughs> My friend Todd bought it. That's fantastic. You know, I've never done real well at selling pieces. My, like I said before, my focus has always been in, in producing helpful content. But, but you know, it's a hard thing to sell pieces. Uh, in the future, yeah, perhaps I'll post more on eBay, but, but I don't have anything else on there right now. I even have an Etsy account that I have yet to put a single piece on because it's just not a need in my life right now. So I, I don't do it, but it would be fun to try to sell these pieces rather than have them in storage. Death Ranger also mentions the uh, color theory being difficult to understand. I know that. I know that it's, it's a lot of information, but I promise you this, that it can click for you and all makes sense. It just takes time to memorize the information and how it works. And there's just not a lot of resources that reconcile the two differences. Light color theory to paint color theory. Uh, different sets of primaries and it's worth reading. I mean I think you can read many articles that explain why the primaries exist in each medium. Uh, but I think that the best learning is question driven. So if you ever have a specific question about color theory, I love to answer them. So just leave a comment on another video. Uh, it's difficult to answer real broad questions that are about something that has many details. So the way I learned was saying, okay, well, let's just start with this, this detail right here and just get that one clear and then we'll go from there. I do like answering questions like that. Def Ranger is from Tucson, only a few hours drive from here. So if you do ever come up to Flagstaff, I would love to help you out with anything. Avril, thank you very much for the nice compliment. More than I deserve, I think, but thank you nevertheless. All right, I'll stop right there. I wanna thank you again for watching. I have a Patreon page. If you're interested in pledging a dollar a month, I post uh, extra videos once a month there for people that choose to do that. It's a big help to us making uh, for, the, for the free content, making that content as good as possible. But uh, I nevertheless just really appreciate you watching. Hey, I know a lot of you might be interested in attending a workshop. I want you to know that I'm giving it a lot of thought right now and talking about scheduling. So I'll keep you posted on any developments of that. Also, if you don't know about the videos that I have for sale, I have extended versions of a lot of the short videos on YouTube. So I've got a whole series on how to paint waves, how to paint a landscape. And if you're interested in additional content that you can purchase that's longer, I have a, a, a bundle for all of those videos. I, re I recommend just getting the all video bundle because it's just all the videos I ever posted on there. It's probably the best thing to get because you find that concepts tie together and uh, seeing similar things at play in different paintings I find helpful. Uh, once again, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.